from Bridgetown, Barbados. And welcome to this media briefing for the launch of the UN Environment Program Report, Bracing for Superbugs, Strengthening Environmental Action in the One Health Response to Antimicrobial Resistance. My name is Carlos Gomez del Campo, Regional Information Officer for Latin America and the Caribbean for UNEP, and I will be moderating this event. This Spotlight UNEP report focuses on antimicrobial resistance, or MAR, as it's, no as it's known, contributing to demystifying and unpacking the distinct but interconnected aspects of the environmental dimensions of antimicrobial resistance, and offering a comprehensive overview of scientific findings on the subject. Before we get to our speakers, I would like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines, please. We have half an hour available, and we hope to use part of that time for questions. We will start with remarks by Her Excellency Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados and Chair of the Global Leaders Group on AMR, and by Ms. Inger Anderson, UN Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, after which it will lead into the media Q&A. We also have experts on hand to respond to questions. Dr. Haile Jesus Getahun, Director of Global AMR Coordination and Quadripartite Joint Secretariat on AMR at the World Health Organization. I am also told that we have been joined uh, happily by the Deputy Prime Minister of Malta, Mr. Bruce Fern. Chris Fern, thank you. Um, also on hand is Dr. Amy Pruden, Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech University, USA, and co-lead author of this report. For media questions, you will see a chat option on your screen. Please submit your questions in writing in this box. You can start to send in your questions right away, as many of you will have received the report under embargo. When you submit your questions, please specify your name and the media outlet you represent. Our contact information is available in the press release and on our website. Should you wish to interview the authors and experts following the briefing, please get in touch via email. Without further ado, I am honored to give the floor to Her Excellency Mia Amor Motley. Thank you very much. Um, I am honored to be here to participate in this launch this morning with my dear sister Inga Anderson, head of the United Nations Environmental Program. The quadripartite group that has led to the Global Leadership Group, which I chair with respect to antimicrobial resistance, is critical for us all. Almost a hundred years ago, it has been since Alexander Fleming found mold growing in a petri dish of bacteria and had a spark of ingenuity that in fact led to decades of growing prosperity, food security and health, much of which we take for granted. We are, however, confronted by a silent slow motion pandemic. And while we have been speaking about it in terms of its impact and its causes, um, particularly with respect to health for humans, anti antibiotics use and abuse um, with respect to industrial livestock use and antibiotics there, with respect to crops. We have not spoken about the environment within which all of this has been taking place. And this report today seeks to ensure that we are far more sensitive to the realities of what is taking place in the environment, the pollution of water, air and soil, doesn't just affect local communities, but the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, and the fungi that are resistant to antimicrobial treatments can be found everywhere today, including in the most remote ice sheets on Earth. They spread far and wide through nature, travel, and trade. This report highlights that we face a convergence of crises. The climate crisis, which I've sp spoken, and continue to speak on behalf of our region. Um, but also now, this issue of antimicrobial resistance that can impact not just our humans, but the natural environment. And unless we tackle them together through bold political action, unless we provide the framework for financing that allows countries to be able to tackle it, unless we tackle the absence of fiscal space, the absence of elbow room, for governments to be able to provide funding in these critical areas, we are at risk of facing far more serious problems as a result of the antimicrobial resistance. Today, we know that there are about five million deaths, one and a half directly as a result, and three and a half million um, associated with 
antimicrobial resistance. That places that as the one of the leading causes of deaths today. But our greatest fear is that by 2050, it may well be the leading cause of death in the world. And to that extent, we need to have tight standards, sound monitoring and surveillance, safe supply chains, and of course, adequate governance structures and adequate financing. We need to ensure <coughs> that we can regulate the use and the disposal of antimicrobials in the production of the pharmaceutical industry and to limit the use of antimicrobials in agriculture, in our agricultural sector. This means training our farmers. This means ensuring that we have systems to monitor. All of this takes money. And that is why I say it comes right back down to funding for development. And hence our important initiative, the Bridgetown Initiative, we believe is critical not just to understanding how we fight the climate crisis, but how we fight the other major global challenges of which antimicrobial resistance and the preparation for future pandemics to fight future pandemics is critical for us. I therefore want to thank the United Nations Environmental Program for providing the scientific basis in this report for us to take further policy action as governments and as international financial institutions, as private sector players, as institutions generally. But above all else, to provide the sensitivity that each individual citizen doing their own part, understanding the impact of their actions, can play their role in ensuring that the world is not overrun by this latest threat. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Just a reminder to media colleagues that you can send in your questions in the chat now so we can queue them up. Next, I'd like to invite UN Under Secretary General and UN Environment Program Executive Director, Ms. Inger Anderson, to make remarks. Good morning to members of the press, um, Madam Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Vice uh, Prime Minister, um, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here in beautiful Barbados. We are here because antimicrobials, they are a super weapon. They protect our human health and the health of the species upon which we depend. They're widely used, antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, antiparasites. They prevent and treat infections in humans, in our livestock, in our aquaculture, and in our crops. Antimicrobials have saved countless of lives and protected vital economic sectors. They continue to do so, and we want them to continue to do so. But their effectiveness is under threat. Scattergun and careless use of this superweapon is increasing the emergence of antimicrobial resistant superbugs and increasing other instances of antimicrobial resistance or AMR to critical levels. As this report tells us, a key pathway for AMR is through pollution of the environment by the pharmaceutical, the agriculture, and the healthcare sectors and municipal uh, water, wastewater systems. The leakage increases the ability of organisms that can harm us to build up resistance to drugs. The wider triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of nature and biodiversity loss, and the crisis of pollution and wa waste contribute further to the development and the spread of AMR through higher temperatures, through extreme weather events, through land use changes, and through biological and chemical pollution. Millions of people already die from AMR worldwide, as we heard from the Prime Minister. And if we continue to pour antimicrobials into the environment, literally down the sink, through runoff from farms, through effluents from manufacturing pharmaceuticals, through disposals of hospital waste and municipal wastewater in an unmanaged way, we can expect at least and I say at least here because this is based on the latest published data from 2016, 10 million deaths per year by 2050. And in a world profoundly skewed in favor of wealthy nations and wealthy communities, AMR will hit the poorest and the most vulnerable the hardest. Poverty, lack of sanitation, and poor hygiene and access to a wash, a water supply and, and sanitation makes AMR worse. Antimicrobial pesticides have a devastating impact 
especially on women, because women farm the world. In some 85 countries, 80, in some countries, 85 percent of all pesticide application on commercial farms and plantations are done by women, often while pregnant or breastfeeding. And AMI is not just a health issue. AMI is not just an environment issue. AMI is an equity issue. One number makes that very clear. By 2030, AMR could cause a fall in the GDP of $3.4 trillion a year. This could push an extra 24 million people into extreme poverty. If we are serious about increasing equity and saving lives, we must now act on AMR. The bottom line is that getting serious on AMR means preventing environmental pollution. Limiting the discharge of antimicrobial laced waste into the environment is important to everyone because every sector is guilty, guilty of adding to the MR burden. I won't get into the specific recommendations of the report, there are many, but let's cover just a few. The pharmaceutical sector must upgrade manufacturing processes overseen by a strong regulatory and inspection system. The agriculture sector must look hard at pesticide use and avoid using antibiotics that corresponds to those used as a last resort in human medicine. In the healthcare sector, strong infection prevention controls programs to reduce antimicrobial use and wastewater treatment to prevent biological pollution can limit environmental contamination. Municipal systems must improve their treatment of wastewater, which is currently too often discharged into the environment, and all of this will take resources. And that is why resources on the table for the Global South is critical. Action in the sectors must be responsible and must be backed by national action plans and financing. With international standards, realignment of subsidies and investments, and more research and surveillance. All of this must be done through the One Health approach, which recognizes the health of human beings, the health of animals, and the health of plants and the health of the environment are interdependent and indivisible. There's simply no way that we can deal with AMR unless we take up a joined up approach on all aspects of the problem. Significant momentum of AMR has developed in large part due to the leadership of Her Excellency Prime Minister Mira Moore Motley and through the Global Leaders Group and the Quadripartite Alliance. We must use this momentum to bring change Investments in new and affordable antimicrobials and other preventive measures should grow, and we must stop pollution at source to ensure this superweapon retains its power. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director. Many thanks to our distinguished speakers. We will now move on to the QA portion of the briefing. We have a couple of questions already asked by multiple journalists, so I will start with those. Uh, for uh, Your Excellency, uh, while AMR is a global problem, like the impacts of climate change, it is worse in the global south. Financial resources are scarce for addressing AMR. What can be done? Thank you. Um, that's why we've been promoting the Bridgetown Initiative, because we believe that we need to be able to mobilize far more, expand, far more resources globally if small countries are to play their part in ensuring that the planet that we live on remains safe. Um, secondly, not only do we need to provide resources for low, poor countries, but we also need to provide resources for those countries that may be middle-income countries but are vulnerable and whose fiscal situation is compromised because of the climate crisis and because of the macroeconomic shocks that the world has been facing in this polycrisis moment. Having said that, once we mobilize resources, if we don't change some of the metrics that we use to determine what is sustainable debt, we will not have the ability for countries to spend that money. So this is a far more complex process. And quite frankly, I think that when the World Bank was established, it was the World Bank to reconstruct and develop after World War II. The challenges today in the third decade of the 21st century have become far more global and the war is different. We are truly at war with climate. We are truly at war with the loss of biodiversity on our planet. We are at war with pollution. We are at war with potential pandemics. 
So unless we change the metrics of how we relate to countries and what determines countries' access to concessional funding and what determines the right to be able to spend, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. The next question is for the Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. The report makes clear links between AMR, antimicrobial resistance, and the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. What is the best way to address AMR in these different but interconnected spaces? Well, if we look at the triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of nature loss, the crisis of pollution and waste, what drives them? It's overconsumption and overproduction in parts of the world. It's underconsumption and underproduction in other parts of the world. Right now we are consuming as if we have 1.8 Earths to sustain our current consumption patterns. Right now we are seeing global population has doubled, uh, material extraction has tripled, GDP had quadrupled, but inequality persists and actually has increased. So per capita basis, high income groups material footprint is 13 times lower in low income, as 13 times that of low income groups. So when we look at that then clearly, as we are pumping stuff into the environment, AMR rises. We can't tackle climate change and nature loss and pollution as separate things in silos. We need to understand that they are interdependent because when we look at what we're doing on the climate side, we are pushing certain species in certain directions and therefore can cause uh, AMR to be more prevalent. When we are seeing nature loss, we, can, uh, we are pushing certain pathogens uh, to emerge and therefore impacting on uh, potential health dimensions. When we are polluting into the environment with antimicrobials, we are causing resistance. We need to look at all of this together. A, uh, climate change disrupt nature, and we have seen, therefore, that we're putting pressure on food systems by adding more chemicals to that um, to s in try to make more food production. But let's face it, um, we don't need to solve a problem if we haven't created it. So how do we flip it such that our agriculture is vibrant and pro-climate, pro such that our farmers have the kind of inputs that they need so that they are not dependent on constant chemical inflows? How do we help farmers make those transitions in a safe and sustainable way? How do we ensure that we don't have that climate runaway uh, situation that we have right now? So it will be about taking that global action, and it will be about stepping up financing, which is why the Bridgetown Initiative, to which the Prime Minister refers, speaks to the rethinking of the manner in which uh, funding is put on the table in today, in 2023, as opposed to back in 1945. And it is that conversation that needs to come together with solving the triple planetary crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director. I have a question here that perhaps uh, Mr. Chris Fern, Deputy Prime Minister of Malta and Vice Chair of the Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance can address. Uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, the AMR Global Leaders Group convenes as this report highlights the growing challenge of AMR. From the perspective of the GLG Group, how will this particular meeting seek to address the situation and what do you hope to achieve through it? Thank you for that question. As Prime Minister Motley has pointed out, close to 5 million people a year lose their lives because of AMR-associated conditions. That's 5 million people a year. Since Christmas of this year, that means twice the population of Barbados have lost their lives because of AMR-related conditions. 10 people a minute lose their life because of AMR-related conditions. So every six seconds, somebody loses their lives around the world because of AMR. And that's just humans. We don't know what happens to our livestock. We don't know what happens in the wild. We don't know what happens and the extent of AMR on the environment. So we are only now starting to realize what a major global threat AMR is posing to all of us, to all of our planet. And today with um, UNEP's new report on, on, on environment, on the environmental impact 
of AMR and of the impact of the environment on AMR, because this is a, a bidirectional uh, situation. We are starting to really bring the One Health approach towards trying to mitigate the problem of AMR. Unless we do this, we are going to run into very, very big trouble. More than a one person every six seconds losing their lives, which is already a major, a major issue. So yes, what the Global Leaders Group is, is doing is, is exactly this. is bringing advocacy, is making people realize, making governments realize, making authorities realize, making the international community realize that AMR is a global threat, and then offering pathways towards solutions. September of next year, the United Nations General Assembly will be holding a high-level um, high meeting specifically on AMR. And that is an opportunity for the world to galvanize around this subject. We need not just to have data, so surveillance is extremely important. As I say, we have an inkling of what is happening to human health, very little knowledge about of what is happening in, an, in, in the animal and the plant and the environmental aspects of, of the situation that we are in. So. We need data, and together with our colleagues in the newly funded and the newly founded multi-stakeholder partnership platform for AMR, we will be start to, to, to collate this, this information. Um, and then we need to have specific financing models for this, so that because um, money, of course, makes the world go around, and, and, and we need we need to have this to, to be able to implement uh, our, our 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 suggestions, and then. Coming forward from today and from today's um, unit report, we need to make sure that the national action plans and over 100, about 150 countries around the world have national action plans on AMR. We need to include environmental aspects strongly into these into these action plans, and then we need to see that they are implemented. So this is uh, all of what the Global Leaders Group um, is attempting to do. It's a big ask, but it's a big problem. So unless we step up to the plate, um, we're going to have problems not just now, but for the generations to come. Many thanks, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Um, I have a question here for Professor Amy Perdue, uh, uh, who is co-lead author of this uh, important report. Uh, Professor Pruden, the report says that polluted waterways are likely to harbor microorganisms that increase AMR in the environment. How can this be avoided? Thank you very much for the question and for the opportunity to join you all. And I want to thank the Global Leaders Group and the Quadripartite Organizations and Prime Minister Motley for bringing attention to this important report. With regards to waterways, the report highlights studies around the world that have shown that human activities specifically pollution generating activities, elevate antibiotics, antimicrobials, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and their genetic material in our waterways. And so we're speaking of our rivers, lakes, streams. They're all receiving both non-point source pollution and point source pollution. And in terms of non-point source pollution, I think we know that agricultural activities really need to be re-examined. We need to rethink how we grow our crops and rear our livestock so that there's less need for antimicrobials and pesticides and fungicides. And also the use of manure as a fertilizer we need to think of ways that effectively contain the resistant organisms and their genetic material. In terms of point sources, we know that wastewater treatment plants receive resistant bacteria and antimicrobials. They can be very effective barriers to release to the environment, but when there are major storm events, which are predicted to increase with climate change, that barrier can be breached. And sometimes also the plants are not operating effectively. So this all needs to be addressed. We also have industrial inputs, especially pharmaceutical manufacturing is a concern. 
And in these industrial situations, we need to think about re-engineering the process so that the waste is not produced in the first place. And where necessary, we do need to design waste treatment processes so that they're mindful of antimicrobial resistance and serve as an effective barrier and not an incubator of resistance. And once these waterways are contaminated, it will be a much bigger and more costly challenge to deal with. And of course, water is life. We rely on it to uh, swim, bathe, and drink the water. So these are all potential exposure routes for spreading antimicrobial resistance. And with this in mind, we need to remember that not all parts of the world are served by centralized wastewater treatment facilities. And those facilities are not necessarily appropriate in every context. So we emphasize the importance of water sanitation and hygiene. So making sure that all have access to waste facilities. Of course, we need to segregate sources of uh, human fecal material, ensure gender access to facilities, and ensure that all have clean water. Because if we promote the health of the populations, then there will be less need for antimicrobials. And so there are benefits all around. And I think it's also important to think about in terms of waterways that these are really potentially informative monitoring points. So as we think about antimicrobial resistance as a One Health challenge, the report really highlights where we have some catching up to do in terms of the environmental dimension of One Health. And waterways, as I've discussed here, are an integrator of multiple sources of antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistant organisms to the environment. So they can be a very useful monitoring point to um, generate the data needed to help inform solutions and to assess the efficacy of interventions. And wastewater treatment plants we're also seeing are a very informative monitoring point that can help assess and keep a finger on the pulse of this really critical public health issue. Very much, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for your expertise. I'd like to end now because we've run out of time by thanking our speakers for lending us their expertise. Many thanks also to our media colleagues for making the time to cover this report. Should you have further questions, we remain available. Do get in touch. Thank you and goodbye. And I just want to thank you, Inga, for choosing Barbados to launch this. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.